this is a uh, uh, Jerry asking to talk about this paper we wrote a few years ago about um, packages and package bees and kind of what what you get um, when you buy a package. Uh, we did this study. I actually did the study. You see the date on the bottom of the photos, two thousand and six, and that's that's when we actually did the work. I think you know generally it still holds. Um, I would like to think that when we publish this, that some of the queen producers and package producers change their behaviors a little bit. Um, I'm not sure that's true, but uh, but we did, uh, es essentially the idea was really to assess when you buy a package of bees, what do you get? Um, and so, you know, essentially a package is, is an artificial swarm. Um, it is, uh, you've got this typically two or three pounds of bees that you're purchasing, it comes, um, it, it comes with a queen in it and and um and it's you know and you you'll you see that little container we'll walk through it in a minute with the with the um uh sugar syrup that they, that they feed on while they're traveling but it's really a way for um us to take bees that are produced in the south areas of abundance and move them to areas of scarcity the north um or throughout the country um it's a nice way to transport them where you don't have to ship comb uh with them so um there's a it's a big industry tens of thousands of these are sold every year shipped across the US. And of course, it allows us to, for those of us in the colder areas to tap into to warm bees and uh, early in the spring, long before we could catch a swarm and get something established. Um, so this is what they look like if you haven't, if you haven't gotten a package, probably most of you have, um, you know, and they often come nailed together in multiple ones, but each of these boxes, uh, in this case was supposed to contain um, uh, three pounds of bees. You can see this one we bought, uh, the picture here, it shows all the dead bees on the bottom. They didn't travel that well. Uh, generally, if you get one like this, you can often um, ask the uh, supplier and they'll they'll sometimes resend them if they have them available. Uh, in this case, we did and they sent them to us. Uh, on top, these were shipped through the U.S. Postal Service, which is generally how you get them, um, uh, unless you go and have a big truck delivered, which a lot of people do. Uh, if you pull off this cardboard on top, you'll get into the, the can inside where the sugar syrup is. Uh, and then, of course, there's a queen and a queen cage that's usually hanging right about where my cursor is at the moment. Um, so, so what are the risks of getting a package? Well, I mean, it's an easy way to get bees, but it's also an easy way to get um, all sorts of things like pests, diseases, uh, resistance to antibiotics, uh, resistance to mite treatments and things like that. Um, you can, of course, get bad bees, uh, which I uh, would say bad bees being unwanted stocks. So you might get some bees that are more aggressive than you want. Um, you can get, again, poor or dead queen inside of that package uh, or dead or dying bees. Uh, and, and again, the producer should reship if you get something where the bees are dead or the queen's dead. And often if they you get a dead queen in one of those, they'll send you, you know, overnight you a queen the next day. So you can get one in pretty quickly. Um, so what comes in there? Well, normally, like I said, you're going to have a queen. You're going to have um, your two or three pounds of bees, depending on what you paid for. Uh, you, of course, will get mites. Uh, that's pretty common. Uh, and there may be other pests and uh, diseases like nosema or even foul brood can be transported in packages, although that's, that's a lot less common. So we were sort of asking this question at the time because, you know, a lot of people are buying packages. What happens uh, to a package in the first year that you have it? Uh, how long, you know, do, do they survive at all? How long, how many of the queens typically die over the summer? How much honey do they make? Um, uh, and then are are we getting what the producers said we're getting? So we bought some that were the smart bees um, and we bought some that were hygienic bees. So these are ones that have disease resistance. They're supposed to uh, show that hygienic behavior where they uncap the cells mm -hmm. and remove, you know, it, it, uh, remove dead larvae. Um, and that's a proxy for like, will they remove um, dead brood that have been killed by a disease like foul brood? Um, so what we did is we actually bought uh, 48 three pound packages from six uh, of six different lines. So we had some Russians, we had some of these smart bees, and then we had a couple that were um, whatever the, the producer said they were their special bees at the time. Um, uh, and uh, and when we bought that from four producers, so we we just wanted to get a, a an idea of what was out there. We weren't trying to do a comprehensive study of everybody in the country that sells packages because that would that'd just simply be impossible. Um, and so we had eight, uh, we established eight colonies of each of those six lines of bees. 
uh, out in our apiaries. And we had two apiaries uh, with 24 colonies each. And this is when I was back as a postdoc at Cornell. So the study was done, of course, in Ithaca, New York. And then we started this in April 2006. We installed the packages. We, uh, it, right before we put the bees into the hive, um, we, we sampled out 250 mils. So we just took a small container um, and, and dumped bees into it through a funnel. Uh, and then um, sealed that up and, and poured some alcohol in it so that we could do an alcohol wash to pull the mites off of the bees. Um, we weighed all of these. We counted um, in, in the samples we took, we counted the workers, drones, and the mites so that we could see what proportion of the bees they sold us were drones, um, what proportion were workers, because of course you're buying workers, right? You don't really want to buy drones. Um, and then we also counted the mites in each of these uh, samples that we took. And we calculated a mic to be ratio and a drone to worker ratio in each of these packages. Um, so drones, why don't you want drones? Of course, they're not productive in establishing a colony. You need drones later in the season for mating. You ex would expect your queen to be producing those. Um, and uh, but you don't really want to buy those. So you're not you're not paying when you pay your uh, hundred and some dollars for uh, a, a package. You're not paying for um the, you're not paying for drones, you're paying for workers. You want bees that are going to start establishing a colony and start bringing in some honey. Um, so we asked this question, like, how many drones do you do you get in one of these? Uh, and then, you know, are some producers better than others? Um, and I, I don't think you'll be surprised by the answer, but I'm going to hold off for a little bit to tell you exactly whether some producers are better than others. Um, uh, we looked at, as we put everything in the hives, we looked at queen mortality. Um, and so we... We had we ordered extra extra packages of each of these. So in total, we had 54 that we got in. And of those um, queens, uh, of those packages, only one uh, arrived dead, which was which was surprising. We we thought we'd have you know two or three, but um, and then after we installed, almost all of those survived the first two weeks. So that was, or I guess all of them survived the first two weeks. We did have some mortality a little bit later, um, and I'll show you those numbers soon. Uh, we also counted the ver varroa destructor mites in the package. So again, we did an alcohol wash and then sorted through every bee um, in that, that was in those containers as 250 milliliters of bees. Uh, and we looked at each one to make sure we had gotten the mites off. So uh, we, we were pretty sure we had estimated a, a good population of mites in those colonies. Um, and again, we're some sources cleaner than others. Well, if you look at the mite per bee ratio, uh, each of these lines is, this represents the mean, this little dot in the middle. And then this is the uh, the, the variation from each producer. So producer number one, we had 0, uh, 0.03 mites per bee. Uh, and our highest population was 0 0.05 mites per bee. One of the producers sold us exactly zero mites. So that was good news. So you might be thinking like, well, 0 0.05 is really not many mites. And, um, you know, not really, but it's not that many, but um, but, but, uh, when you start getting a whole bunch of them and you start thinking about, um, how many 0 0.05 is that, that really means, um, that there's, you know, five mites for every 100 bees in the package that turns out to be quite a lot. Um, so if you were going to do an ether roll, for example, that would be about nine, um, nine mites in your ether roll. So you would not want that. And at that infestation rate, uh, if you figure there are 10,000 bees in your package, you just bought 500 varroa mites. Uh, so, and this was, keep in mind, across five different, um, or rather eight different um, packages that we uh, tested from that producer. So clearly one producer the it was not treating at all. And most of the other producers were, were probably not treating before they made those packages and shipped them. But the one, of course, did come in very clean. Um, so if you looked at the drones, so mites are one thing, they're gonna affect your, they're gonna affect your productivity. And um, and you might wanna, if you got a package that had the, that many mites, you would wanna treat it almost immediately um, before you really got that colony established. Uh, the drones are interesting because you can't really treat that. Uh, and it turned out that two of the producers actually sent really high numbers of drones. Um, and this in my mind is sort of, and the mites are one thing, right? Maybe you can't get out and treat all your colonies before you make your, your packages, but drones, you can, as you make a package, you can shake them through a big funnel that has a, a queen excluder in it. And the male, the drones can't pass through that. So this just showed that that this producer that's sending us, you know, five drones for every hundred bees 
um, these these two producers, they weren't doing what everybody else in the industry did, which is to uh, make sure that they excluded drones from the packages. So, you know, really, if you had um, if you had that many drones, you're really buying a lot of drones, which it doesn't make any sense to do. Um, there's no reason you would want to have that many drones in your colony. And, and, and so we did have one colony that was 20% or we have one package when we got it that was actually 20% drones when it arrived. And, and that's, you know, quite frankly, inexcusable. There's no reason you should have that many drones. Um, so we did look at the queen survival. I mentioned that over time. Um, after we installed them in, we, we fed them, we got the colonies established. We went back in mid-July and, uh, and looked at all the colonies to see if the queens were um, dead or alive. Um, and really, we had pretty high survival. Um, we only had two of the queens that died, um, and and we have a third which uh, had stopped. It had become a drone layer. She was still in the colony, but it was it was full of drones. So you do expect, I guess, some that won't be great. Um, by mid August, two more queens had superseded. They superseded with good queens that that were able to maintain the colony. But but again, for some reason, um, the uh, the the bees they had in the hive didn't like them, and they they made their own queens. So one of the things we were interested in um, was really how productive can can these uh, these packages be if you install them in the first year. Um, when I was learning beekeeping 25 years ago, I was told like don't expect to have um, you know don't expect to get any honey off of a package. Um, and so we were interested in whether or not it you could actually build up a colony um, the first year that would be big enough to get, get give you a honey crop. So we took this, uh, we had a, a, an easy loader on the back of our bee truck and we suspended the scale off of it and we would lift up the hives with the hydraulics and, uh, and weigh them um, at, at multiple times during the summer. And then we tracked the weight. Uh, and, and really at the end of the fall was what we were interested in uh, at the end of the season, how much they had made, how much honey they had made. Um, so here's another one. We had another, uh, this is a tripod we used when we couldn't get the, the big truck into the yard. Uh, and again, we would wrap it with this strap and then we lift it up and weigh it. And so honey production did vary pretty um, substantially. So we looked at average daily weight gain. So this is, uh, you know, um, kilograms of, or no, this, sorry, this is pounds of honey per day uh, that they gained over the season. Uh, and so there was a pretty broad range. Now Ithaca, New York has a really, really strong um, honey flow, especially late in the season with goldenrod. So um, you might be not doing great, but by the time you hit fall, you can actually end up with quite a bit of honey. Um, but there was a lot of variation among lines. And again, remember, this is one that had a lot of drones in it, and it also had a lot of mites. Uh, but this one also had a lot of drones and a lot of mites, and they actually ended up recovering and doing very well by the end of the season. Uh, and then the rest sort of fell in this group that were, were all pretty similar. Um, so yeah, they made honey. They made enough honey that we could harvest off a, a box or two um, from each colony at the end of the year. That wasn't bad. We we were pretty excited about that. This this one less so. Uh, most of those did not come out of the summer looking great, but um, they did all right. We went back the following year and and actually looked at um, uh, survival over the winter. Um, and you know, and some of them did better than others. I think the one that the but it seemed that honey production was the thing that really. Uh, that, that really impacted um, the survival over winter. So getting to that fall was the important thing. Uh, we assessed hygienic behavior and, and um, why do you do this? This is a, really an assay of disease resistance. So um, hygienic behavior is shown to be correlated with the colony's ability to defend itself from foul brood, both American and European. Um, and it also is tied to, um, to other disease resistant traits. Uh, and including things like getting, you know, detecting and, and killing varroa mites. The the smart bees uh, are the ones that do that. So they they can sense varroa in the the cell and uncap it and remove the the uh, parasitized larvae. So we use this freeze killed brood assay. Um, I I like this one. It's um it it makes you feel like a mad scientist because you're using uh, uh, liquid nitrogen and you get all the the steam and 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 smoke from it come or the steam from it coming up and. And, uh, you know, it always turns heads when you do it for people the first time. So um, I, I've got a few pictures here, but we you, you select a part of the frame that's got capped brood. So you can see the capped brood back here. Um, and you what you want inside of it is purple eyed larvae. So usually when you find the comb, you have to uncap it and and or you'll see the larvae in there with their eyes that are purple. 
um, or purple eyed pupae. It's the beginning of the pupil stage. Um, and uh, it's before they turn dark. So you want to get them early enough. Uh, but you also don't want to do it on on larval bees. And so here's my uh, uh, one of one of the technicians, Gill, who was doing this at the time. And you can see there's our tank of liquid nitrogen. And you you'd push the the can into the frame, and then you'd you'd dump the liquid nitrogen, and it would freeze that brood. So that's what's the freeze kill brood assay. Uh, and then uh, you would come back 24 hours later. Um, here's here's the nitrogen. You can actually see it bubbling in here. Um, and uh, and that kills that brood. So any brood inside of this can is going to be killed. So we've got a standard size of brood that's killed. Uh, we we marked all of them and um, with the date and the uh, time that we did it and, and which colony it was from. So we could go back and compare the next day. Um, we took a picture of it and we, we would count all the cells of brood within this circle. So we would know how many we killed. You come back 24 hours later and you would again count all the empty cells. So did they get them all? In this case, it was easy because everything was cleaned out as 100% hygienic uh, at 24 hours. And, um, but some of them barely cleaned any out. So this is a non-hygienic colony that the bees are not detecting. The trick here is that the bees can either detect that they're, that the pupae in here are dead or, or they can't. If they can detect that they're dead, they'll remove them and get them out of the hive. But in this case, they can't, they have not detected that. So they just left them in there. So basically, can the, can the bees tell that they've got some stinky rotten bees in there that they need to get rid of or not? You can come back in 24 hours, you can do it in 20, and, and then again in 48 hours. And that gives you um, an idea of how quickly they're hygienic, not just um, uh, whether or not they completely clean it out, but how fast they clean it out. And so what we saw was that by the different colonies, um, the different producers rather, some were, were more hygienic than others. Um, but the reality is, is that these weren't, uh, you know, statistically that different from each other. Even these lines that were sold as highly hygienic um, were only a bit more hygienic than the ones that weren't sold as hygienic. So all the bees out there had some level of hygienic behavior. Some were better than others. And even in some of the lines that were supposed to be highly hygienic, they did not um, clean everything out. So nobody was perfect. And at, at 48 hours, however, we were up into the 85 to, to about 95% of the colonies uh, uh, would clean out, sorry, 85 to 95% of the dead brood would be cleaned out of all of the colonies. So um, at 48 hours, the hygienic score is better. At 24 hours, some weren't quite so great. Um, so what is the what is the quality of the package? Well, it was highly variable among producers. Again, drone levels varied. Uh, some sent us a lot of drones, um, some sent us a lot of mites, others, they didn't. They sent us a really nice quality product that um, we were able to put in, establish quickly and produce honey. Um, you know, the, one of the downsides of this mite level is, you know, if you're treating, that's an additional cost that the, uh, that the, the producer is not bearing, you're bearing it because you're out there buying the chemicals to treat. Um, queen quality essentially was, we, we saw it was pretty good across uh across them, but there were some that, that requeen themselves. We didn't see any patterns from producer to producer with the queen quality. So, so that was a good thing. We thought that, that, that having good queens that laid eggs, you know, if you had one producer that was selling bad queens, um, that would, that would be a problem. Um, there may be other diseases. Uh, and then the other factor on like buying a package is how much does it cost? And if you're going to buy you know, if you're going to buy uh, a selected line like Smart Bees or or an expensive, you know, Russian or something, do, do you, um, you know, how much cost are you willing to to take, not knowing what quality you're going to get in the end? Mm -hmm. um, and especially when you looked at those honey production uh, weights, where they're pretty similar um, for most of the colonies, is it really cost? Does it really benefit you to spend the extra money? Now, if you're selecting for disease um, resistant lines and you're buying that way. That's a different calculation too, because you may have reasons to do that that aren't necessarily directly related to how much honey you make. Um, so again, uh, we we assessed this queen survival. That was good. Um, we did also later look at defensive behavior. We had a couple colonies we had gotten out of Texas or a couple lines we had gotten out of Texas uh, and those bees were pretty hot. So um, later on, we, we were really interested in that and, and if it really was different, we looked at that honey production, the hygienic behavior, 
and then whether or not these ones that were sold to us as selected smart lines um, were really smart. So I would say that, you know, general conclusions is not all packages are created equal. Um, uh, there was a variation in price on what we bought and it wasn't, a, so sometimes the cheaper ones we bought actually some of the better lines um, that were less expensive um, actually were the ones that had fewer drones and, and mites in them, uh, which which uh, was also a little surprising. We thought that the, the folks that were charging us more money would send us a better product, but that was not always the case. So, um, you know, I think it's also really important if you're getting ready to buy um, packages, you know, to ask those questions. Um, how are they, you know, are, are these, are these going to be drone free um, when you send them? And, uh, and uh, do you do mite treatments before you ship the packages to me? Um, you know, is, is the consumer um, demand the quality and you have the right to ask those questions and make sure that, that what you're getting is a top quality product. Uh, these are the folks that worked on the project uh, with us. So this was my, my beekeeping crew here. Uh, that's Gil, you saw him earlier. We had a couple um, outstanding hives that summer. Uh, these were not started from packages. This is uh, Rick Siccarelli, who um, co-authored one of the papers with me, and um, and Nick Calderon, who was my postdoc advisor and one of my co-authors on this. So um, I'm happy to answer questions that you have, and um, it can be related to this or other stuff as well. I'm happy to chat. So, so Jamie, is, yeah, I mean, obviously, in a in a package, you're not looking for drones but in a swarm there's always drones mm -hmm. why are there why are they in there and do they serve some purpose or are they just long for the party or um you know so i mean does a new hive actually kind of want some guys hanging around you know i mean if they don't find you handsome they should find you handy at least right <laughs> yeah I, you know i don't so, so you're right. So in a swarm, you will have some drones in a swarm. Um, I will also underline that a swarm is generally free. I mean, what's free, right? You've got to climb up a, a tree to get it. But um, yeah, is there a purpose? I mean, is there a need for those drones? Or not? Really, there shouldn't be, right? Because it's not, you should be getting a queen that's fully mated. She shouldn't need drones to, to go out and mate with. Um, it probably doesn't hurt to have a few around, but I think when you get into that 5% of your of what you bought as drones, that's getting to be a pretty high number. Um, you know, it, it's, yeah, it, again, you saw the numbers on the honey, right? They Some of those still produced a fair amount of honey and actually did really well. So it's not like it's going to kill you, but I don't know. It's what you want to spend your money on. Um, that That's just kind of how I took it. There's no real biological need for those drones in that package, though. So I'm, I'm assuming that when you installed these um, packages, you gave them a pretty good head start. You gave them a full box of drawn comb. We actually, what we did that it wasn't quite that. So we gave when we put the packages in, we had um, there were ten frame, uh, you know, deeps that we put them into. Uh, we gave them actually, I say it's ten frame deeps, but we had a a, a div division board feeder in there, so they was eight probably eight frames, I think. And uh, and then a, a feeder full of um, sugar uh, or syrup, and um, and we alternated. We had four frames of foundation and four of drawn comb. So okay, so they, they got they had a little bit of a head start, but it wasn't you know um, it wasn't all drawn comb. And that was just because we had to put in forty eight packages, and we only had so much to so much drawn comb to give them. So uh, the the drawn drawn comb was it. Uh, light colored or white drawn comb or oh you know that was in Good. 2006 so mm -hmm. i'm gonna claim ignorance i don't remember we tried i think we tried it we didn't give them garbage right you know we were we were trying to give them a a good start but i yeah there it was probably a mixture okay um there's i suppose there's no way of excess um uh assaying the age distribution of the population in a in one of these packages not when you get the package. No, I mean, you know, you're getting, there's really, I mean, the only way you could probably do that, and this would be a lot of work. Um, you could probably pull out a, you know, a bunch of workers like we did in the thing, but you could probably look at wing wear. That might be the one way you could get to like aging those workers. Most of the packages are made in the spring. You know, so the colonies they're made from are growing, right? And so probably the age distribution skews toward pretty young. 
Um, but you know, there's a lot of guesswork there. I don't know. Uh, the reason that comes to my mind is that uh, Wally Shaw's book, which uh, he did a program for us in, in January, he mentioned that the age distribution of a swarm is around 10 days old. And uh, he's, I think he said he got that from Mark Wilson's book. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's a pretty young distribution and that's really primed to drawing a lot of comb um, mm -hmm. compared to um, the rate at which a swarm draws comb. How do you feel about the packages capacity for drawing comb? I think, I think they're really good. And again, like I said, I think these probably based on the time of year, they make them skew toward a young age distribution as well. Um, I, I think my sense on packages is if you're feeding them, when you put them in, they can draw comb pretty fast. They're, they're, they're primed for that as well. So I, I've, I've never measured that, you know, a package versus a swarm and how quickly they do it, but. Okay, the other question I have is, uh, what did you assay for like Nosema or viruses or any other diseases? Yeah, we did. We actually looked at Nosema at the end of the year. So, um, and that was a separate study. You know, we did that sort of as a separate study, but um, there were differences from colony, colony to colony and Nosema rates at the end of the year. Um, it, but it wasn't correlated with, necessarily the the producer we got them from it was actually more driven by the apiary we had them in so those that were all in the ap one apiary together they tended to have higher nosema than the other apiary so that and that was probably because we had some old hives closer to the one uh, and my guess is they just picked it up over the summer and spread it around so it didn't seem like they had shipped it to us okay and it didn't seem like anybody shipped you any foul brood either no, no, no foul brood. We didn't detect any foul brood all summer. And we actually purposely didn't put any, um, there were no antibiotics added at that point. So um, we just let them go through the summer and they all, they were all clean. So that was good as well. And, it, and my guess is that probably those, um, those pathogens, be, just the way they're transmitted are less likely to come in a swarm. You know, you think of those as like things that are passed around on comb quite a bit. Nosema can go obviously B to B and come in bee guts, but those young bees coming out of the winter probably didn't have much. Do you have anything uh, in relation to this study that says uh, what's going on with newts that are uh, purchased? So we didn't look at nukes and a reason for that was that uh, it gets the system is, well, first of all, there's just a ton of these packages sold, right? Um, mm -hmm. People make various claims about their queens and their, their lines. And, um, and so that was just an easy one to kind of look at. Um, and when you get, the problem with getting a nuke is that you're getting all that comb and stuff too. So there's just so many more variables in what could be good or bad quality. Um, so we we avoided that just because this was, we wanted to keep this controlled and, and compact so we could make direct comparisons. Yeah, hi, Jamie, thanks for your talk. Um, yeah, in Alameda County, we tend to, I don't know, when I first started the club five years ago, somebody offered to, um uh sell packages from Dia Diablo Valley Club. But that like happened one year and then we started the local bee initiative and we were all about no buy local nukes. There's plenty of beekeepers around here who sell you a, a locally adapted queen and hive. Mm -hmm. And then you get the resource of that person if something should go wrong you know, your phone call, click away from getting help on that hive. Um, so. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's, that's a great point. And I think the, um, the thing, of course, we were doing this study and the folks that were selling us these, they knew we were Cornell, right? Um, so they're like, oh, <laughs> we didn't tell them why we were buying them, but I mean, they, they, they know, um, you know, you're selling it to a university. What are they going to do? They're going to do experiments, right? 
Um, so when we were, we'd call them up and be like, hey, the queen was dead. They were, yeah, yeah, we'll ship you one overnight. Now, I don't know what if they would do that. You know, they should do that for everyone. That's what they're supposed to do. But whether or not they're as quick about it for, you know, your average beekeeper, no idea. But so so I, I do think there's a real value in that local connection of somebody you can say, hey, this this isn't working or something's wrong here. Come look at it. Um, so yeah, packages are convenient, and that's the number one thing about them. But there, you you are definitely getting, in some cases, whatever they want to send you, um, and and the support system's not necessarily there. But if you do have a producer who does provide that support system, you you have a good situation. Oh yeah, and and we had like I said, we had some of these guys were really responsive and you know just were were great. But um, and I've bought packages beyond that, you know, myself and and just from my own backyard and not had and I've always had good service. But you know, you, I think once you get establish a relationship, that's when you know like that's the person I'm going to keep going back to to buy these. And I think there was a Gregory, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, do you um, uh, um, have any uh, data as far as uh, the survivability of the survival rate, actually, of bees from different areas? Like maybe getting bees from an area that's with from an environment that's not similar to the one at Cornell? Versus no. So, you know, we, of course, all these were bought so we had we got bees from texas arkansas california florida that were that sent to us so none of those bees were local right they were all shipped in um from big that was one of the requirements right it had to be a a, a package producer that would ship us bees from anywhere um so if because there were people we tried to get packages from they were like oh we're not gonna we don't ship that far away and you know they were smaller producers or whatever and which was fine you know we just couldn't include them in the study if they wouldn't send them to us um there are, you know, there's plenty of people out there that are doing that more sort of looking at local bee stuff. This, you know, this was um, what back when we did this, the one few people we could get local bees from would only sell them as nukes. And like I said, we decided we weren't going to do that. We were just going to stick with the, or stick with the packages and not get nukes. So, um, but there are, I mean, I think like Steve Shepard up in Washington State, he's did, he's got some like local bee stuff going on and a breeding project there where he's assessed stuff. And um, so what I'm actually asking is like, did you see any difference in the survivability of bees coming from different areas? I mean, could you could you yeah. make any conclusions on that at all? So the ones we got, so so I'll tell you the ones we got from Texas. Like I said, they were pretty. Um, they were pretty aggressive and we, uh, ended up midsummer. We did this, we looked at that, that an aggressive index. So we actually did some tests and they were definitely, you know, uh, scientifically controlled experiment, nasty bees. Um, uh, and that's, that's, and so we were like, well, these obviously have some Africanized, you know, genes in them. Um, and so we took those because we were pretty sure we had Africanized bees uh, at that point, um, we did requeen those before winter because we did not want to have a risk of being, you know, guess what? Cornell gave New York Africanized bees. We were pretty cognizant of the fact that we didn't want to be in that situation. So um, so we couldn't really follow them legitimately through the full winter. But those ones, um, those definitely, uh, I think, by the time we requeened them was far enough in the fall that that we were concerned that, that that they had a lot of Africanized workers in there. And I think those didn't survive quite as well, but it wasn't hugely different because we had already requeened them. But. Uh -huh. Yeah, because I mean, part of the, the, the local bee initiative is the, trying to is assessing on their winter survivability. Mm -hmm. In the Bay Area, we don't have much difficulty with winter survivability anyway, but still, um, I don't know how valid a criteria that is for selecting local bees, you know? Yeah, no, I think it's actually, I think winter survivability is a great criteria um, because it always seems to be the thing, especially, you know, for those of us in the North, um, it it definitely is a um, an issue, right? So getting bees through the winter. We used to, I know you were talking about when I logged on, you're talking about covering hives and, you know, how do you prep for winter? 
Um, we used to, in, in Cornell, we would actually, we had these, um, uh, these plastic wraps that were about an inch thick. They had insulation inside and we would wrap two hives together. Um, and then we would put a layer of foam on top and then cover it with a little piece of plywood. I always thought it was overkill. Um, that, that was my opinion, but I, you know, Nick was the boss. So I was doing what, you know, we did, we did what he wanted to do. Um, a guy down the road from us, uh, who was a commercial beekeeper. Uh, so he was, he would come over and, and, uh, help us with stuff. But when you went out to his hot hives in the winter, he didn't wrap them at all. Um, he didn't put anything on top. Uh, and, and he had no more mortality than we did in his eighth year. <laughs> so, you know, maybe he fed them better. I don't know, but his, his seemed to all make it through the winter really well. And ours, not quite so much. So, I mean, we, um, you're I'm bringing not, all the, you're bringing all these bees in from different areas. And do you just continue on with them? Do you let, do you try to get them through winter? And, and then you, what do you do with these bees afterwards? Yeah. So, I mean, in the case of the, uh, at that point, that's what we did. We, um, next spring, you know, buy some new Queens or whatever and, and put them in. And we were doing, um, we were doing some breeding. In fact, I mentioned Steve Shepard. And part of the reason I mentioned him is because at the time he had a breeding program going on. Um, and, uh, and he shipped us a bunch of the Washington state bees to test there to see how they would do. So we requeen most of those with his bees the next spring. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, uh, you know, I think, and then, and at that point I got a different job and left. So, um, so I, I don't, I don't know what happened to him ultimately two or three years later, you know, if, if they, if, uh, Nick kept them, I'm guessing he used them for other experiments at that point, but. Well, <laughs> Can I raise my hand? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, the, one of the issues is that you've got, you know, master beekeepers uh, working those colonies. And what we have in a bee club is all these packages are going to new bees, uh, new beekeepers. And so it's really difficult to tell uh, what uh, the survivability of certain producers or packages and so forth because you have these other factors involved that really don't have anything necessarily to do with those particular bees you give them to one you know beekeeper who's never kept bees before versus an eight-year beekeeper I, i'm i'd be willing to bet that the odds are better for the that package that went to the eight-year beekeeper oh yeah yeah i mean you know that's that's absolutely true we weren't you know, obviously weren't testing for skill level. Um, you know, we were, we were really looking at like, if you, you know, and, and, and the reality is this, you, you know, if they're selling you, I, mean, I think the big message to take home, like if you're getting a package of bees, you should test for mites right away. Uh, and you might look in and make sure that you've got, you know, if you see a lot of drones, something like that, these are signs, right. That maybe this isn't the highest quality package uh, that you yeah. got. Um, yeah. No, I don't hear Oh, I'm sorry. No, I so I would just say it's our our, our view was like let people know what they're getting, um, or what they might be getting, so that they know what to look for uh, when it shows up. That was great advice, especially for the new people. Mm -hmm. One of our members who actually lives in San Mateo County did a survey among members of her club. Um, did your colony survive? And um, one of the criteria that was examined in the survey was whether it was from a package or yeah. from um, continuing colony or uh, some other kind of situation. And she said distinctly the highest mortality was out of packages. Again, uh, you can't tell whether that's necessarily a matter of the newbie beekeeper that's getting the packages or just the packages themselves. Right. And a newbie might be putting them all in on foundation and not know that that's going to be really hard on them. Um, you know, when you think that, that you, know, you probably know the number, right? It's like seven pounds of honey to make one pound of wax. Right. Um, so that's a lot of energy that they're devoting to just drawing comb uh, and getting, you know, it's somewhere that they can, the queen can even lay an egg. You know, they've got to put a lot of energy into that. So, yeah, I think... Um, that that's another issue with newbies is they may not have the equipment to really give those packages a head start. And one of yeah. the neighboring clubs um, very seriously uh, promotes the sale of packages in the spring. Hmm. 
And uh, in fact, their arrangement is that you have to be a member in good standing for a couple of years before you can get on the swarm list. And um, the result is that the swarm list is rather small. It seems to me that uh, the new beekeepers uh, need the swarms more than they need the packages. But that's, uh, you know, opinions vary. <laughs> I, I, I sense that you have an opinion on this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did help out a, a, a new beekeeper who did buy a package from someone and I came to him in the middle of the summer and he had no, he, he started out with no comb. He got the package and fortunately who, whoever was selling him asked him about how much comb he was putting in the hive. And he said, I don't have any comb. I don't have nothing. <laughs> So he gave him a couple of old janky, you know, black frames, at least to get the queen someplace to hang out for, for the first couple of months while they built up. But yeah, so I, I think the, the, you know, Jerry, as far as your anecdote of, of survivability of packages in the club, many of those would be first or second year beekeepers, because after that, you learn how to do splits and maintain it and and you end up with more than one hive um, and, and after two or three years you end up like you know sue and sung with more hives and you know what to do with um <clears throat> and uh you know and giving them away so there's a little bit of a bias i think in that well one of my particular biases to try and <coughs> the uh, local gene pool local and not bring in out of area genetics yeah. yeah. But having new beekeepers trying to do a package, those are two things that are difficult. <laughs> the package is difficult, and then a new beekeeper, it, it, it just needs, <coughs> it needs more maintenance. Yeah, and I also think winter survivability too really depends on the beekeeper and how are they managing those bees <laughs> in <laughs> August and September. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think that's key. And I think a lot of, I mean, you know, everyone here has been a first time beekeeper at some point, right? Um, and and so so I always tell people when they're, they're like, oh, should I get bees? And I'm like, how do you like failure? Um, <laughs> because if you like failure, it's definitely for you. Um, but yeah, I think th there's a steep learning curve on, on, uh, on bees and getting them through that first or second winter um and you know i know probably more beekeepers than not have gotten through the first year and been like i think i'm just going to sell this stuff and move to a saner hobby um because it, it's hard right you know and it takes a long time to get good at it and the the price of failures is pretty high that first year or two um, not that it's not worth doing but yeah, I think it kind of reflects the turnover in the membership of the club. We get like uh, our membership's about 400. We probably get 100 new members every year and have a lot drop out as well. Uh, we, we don't know how many people are actually leaving or if they're just fading away. You know, some people just don't show up at meetings, right? And, um, we're, we're finding some beekeepers every once in a while that have been keeping bees for years. Um, you know, and then they just don't... Uh, they're, they're, they're just not active in the club anymore, but they're still keeping bees. Yeah, I think that's true. People learn how to do it and then they don't feel they need the support of the club anymore, or maybe they didn't feel like it was a warm, fuzzy place to be a, a member of, um, or as you say, maybe it's just because they kept failing out at it. Um, yeah. I also think that probably um, the club membership represents a few percent of the beekeepers in the entire East Bay. And many of those beekeepers might be just bee havers, have a hive in the yard to uh, make for some, uh, some accommodation for the bees, but not really keep bees. That is always true. Oh, you said say. Have we exhausted? Life is much question. simpler as a haver. <laughs> well, the other 
uh, thing that I've noticed is that some areas are kind of overrun with beekeepers in, in the East Bay, uh, North Oakland and Berkeley. Um, Jennifer Radke said that she walked a block in each direction from her house in um, North Oakland, I think, and counted um, hives in like 10 or 12 yards, uh, all within a block radius of her yard with several hives in it. And I'd be curious to know how much honey they get. <laughs> yeah. Well, then there's the drifting bees carrying pathogens and the overloading of the forage, especially uh, in the summer and fall when there isn't enough anyway. Well, and Jennifer did that also a long time ago, made that statement. It's been a lot of years since then. Um, but I do think that there is high bee density in certain areas of Berkeley and Oakland. Um, for sure. Yep. Uh, with that high bee, bee density also comes robbing. Which is interesting because I didn't experience any robbing this season um, where I did last year. So I have a question for Jamie that's not really related to this topic, but I still want to ask it anyway. And that's how's the B program going at Cornell now that Tom is retired? That that's a good question. So they have um th there's actually a pretty good program right now. There's the the guy who's who's running Dice Lab, uh, which was where I worked, um was uh uh is it, Scott McArt. And um, he works on, so he's doing all sorts of, he's got a ton of projects, a lot of students. In fact, he's at these meetings that I'm at up here. Uh, and uh, so he's he brought a bunch of his grad students to the meeting. So they've got a lot of stuff going on um, and uh, a really active program. I think actually probably when I was there in, in 2005, 2006 was the end of uh, Nick Calderon, who I worked for was, was running Dice. Tom's lab was just down the street from us. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, Tom was actually, he was actually in the, I think, Department of Neurobiology. It, he wasn't even in entomology. So it was an odd uh, thing, but, you know, he did all that sort of behavior and learning among bees, uh, really, really cool work. Um, and uh, so he, he kind of kept things going after Nick retired. Um, Nick retired right after I left, about two years um, after I left there, he retired. And then a couple years later, they hired Scott and Scott's you know, now 10, 12 years there, and he's got a great program going. Yeah, the reason I asked that's kind of selfish because I've signed up for that uh, master beekeeper program, but I was kind of disappointed when I heard that Tom retired. And now I'm hearing from you that there's been quite a brain drain recently uh, from the program. Well, I mean, I think now it's kind of rebuilt. Yeah, I think when, th so that really, um, you know, Nick retired, I think in 2008 or 2009. So, so since then they've, they've really built it back up. It's, I, I think actually now it's, they've got a great program, I would say probably better than when I was there. I think I was there at the end of Nick's um, career and he was just kind of, I don't want to say phoning it in, but um, you know, he was getting ready for retirement at that point. Um, mm -hmm. So, but we're, you know, I think they've really rebuilt it. It's really quite active now. That sounds good. Yeah. Uh, Jamie, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, in 2006 uh, at Dice Lab, uh, were they working on the uh, Master Beekeeper program at that point? Uh, were you involved in that? And secondly, where was Tom Seeley during all this? You haven't mentioned him. Yeah. So um, in 2006, uh, the Master Beekeeper program had been developed. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I didn't, I didn't do any work with it other than, um, cause I, that was all Nick's stuff at that point. He was running it. Um, I'm trying to remember what happened. You know, and then, I, then, then I took another job, right? So I, I was just there as a two-year postdoc and then I got a permanent position with USDA and I was, you know, obviously like, give me a real paycheck. So, um, uh, Tom at the time was uh, 
he, you know, so he had a lab going and he had a couple people working for him and um, he didn't, wasn't part of this study that I just showed you. That was just Nick and I, um, he had some other stuff going on with looking at the, um, he was really into, I'm trying to remember what the name of the, the forest is. They had this experimental forest and they had the, the feral colonies there that had established. So he was out doing these beeline Ar things and tracking. Arno, Ar Arno Forest? Is that yeah, there it is, Arno Forest. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, he was doing that stuff. I went out with him a couple of times because I was like trying to pick his brain to learn how to do, I didn't know how to do beelining and stuff. So um, yeah, it, it, he, Tom was great. He would, he, he's just one of those guys that like, always willing to teach you something if you're willing to learn it and um and so it was it was it was good to be around but we didn't work on this project together unfortunately it was and, not and did, did emma mullins come much later after you left i don't she, know emma she was running the master program uh, that must have been after i was gone yeah yeah i think scott uh i was talking about scott scott mcgart who's running dice now I think he's hired, like I said, he's really built up the 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 program to where it sort of used to be. Um, but that did take a while. You can't just walk in and, you know, suddenly fill the lab with people. And uh, it takes takes a while to get some good, competent people around. So, But I don't know. I don't know Emma. If she's still there. No, she's not there. Oh, okay. I was wondering why three pound package is the standard. Is that considered an optimal number of bees, or is that just what they like to sell? I think, um, yeah, I, I think the why has three pounds become the standard? And I think you know, used to be you could get, and you still can, I think, get two pound packages. Um, but the success rate of those was not as good. So if you really want to get a colony started, three pounds is a better number. It turns out to be about ten thousand bees. So um that that is about the number the average number you want to come through winter with anyway so it's a good number to get a colony started um and i think when you go smaller the success rate's lower and bigger doesn't really make it any better so did anybody ever do a study on swarms and what how, how big a swarm because I mean, some of our swarms have ended up huge. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, especially if you get three or four colonies right next to each other and they all kick off at the same time. Uh, you know, and then other times you just get this little puny thing that barely fills up a frame. Yeah. No, over the years, I mean, and there's a lot of sort of the old American Bee Journal literature. You can go through old American Bee Journals and read about, you know, the people back in the 50s and 60s were getting swarms and they were weighing them and figuring out how many bees were in them and average swarm sizes. Yeah, there, all that stuff has been known for for decades, really, about how many bees are in swarms and how early season swarms are bigger than later. Well, early season they get they get bigger up to a point, and then they get a lot smaller. So the later in the year, um, swarms tend to be smaller, and a lot of those tend to be secondary swarms that have come off of colonies. So, but yeah, there's a whole bunch of there's a whole bunch of swarm uh, information out there, and. Uh, that would be picking my brain pretty good if I could remember what those were. But um, but there's a lot of stuff in those old. Uh, I, I used to when I first started beekeeping, we had and and even when I was at Dice Lab, we had all these collections of old American bee journals. Um, uh, and I would just go through them and and read and read and read. And if you can get your hands on them, they're they're worth it because there's a lot of stuff in there that that back in the day people would do. <laughs> Let's catch a swarm and count the bees. Um, <laughs> but, somebody had time to do that. Well, yeah, and it, not, once somebody does it, there's no point in redoing it, right? You know, the, the size of a bee doesn't change, so. Oh, what did you feed your bees besides sugar syrup? Oh, me personally? Yeah. Um, yeah, I just do, I just do, uh, uh, just do syrup. I do a light syrup in the spring and then uh, heavy syrup in the fall. And um, yeah, nothing fancy. Um, and you know, know, pollen patties? I've done pollen patties in the past. You know, I, I, my, you know, it, it sort of do that, you know, assess the colony. And if it looks like they need pollen patties, um, 
but generally not. I'm generally not given pollen patties. So when you did the study on uh, the uh, packages, were you with the S USDA at the time or were you with the university? I was with Cornell then. Yeah, I, I oh. left Cornell to go to USDA. Yeah. I got it. And so that was a, a, a some professor decided to do that study or is that was that something that you came up on your own? Yeah, so so Nick Calderon was the professor in the lab. He was uh, the guy who hired me right out of my PhD to work on this. And we, he and I sat down and we were talking about various projects. And this was one we both thought would be kind of fun to do. It really, it was one of those like, hey, this would be cool to know. Um, and so, you know, we kind of kicked around various ideas and we settled on this one. I don't remember if it was his idea or mine, quite honestly, at this point. But we, we both thought it would be a, a neat experiment. So that's why we jumped into it. Um, and uh, so then I, you know, after a, a, I was there about just over a year and then I left and went to USDA because I got a permanent position um, mm -hmm. you know, the, with a postdoc. You're there until the money runs out and then <laughs> you got to go to the next place. So uh, once I got a permanent job, I did that. And then um, about three years ago, I went, to, I left USDA to go to Ohio State, which is where I am now. So on the hot bees from Texas, <clears throat> mm -hmm. you said you queen those. Um, and was was it like multiple packages? So they were all generally hot. And then when you requeened them, how long did it take for them to calm down? I mean, uh, so, was it instantaneous or did it take? Did you have yes. to go through the whole cycle? So we had two lines out of Texas. And the one line was every one of those was um, every one of those packages. And I don't, I don't know what's the packages, but the queen, whatever it was, those queens were definitely... Um, yeah, they didn't like us. Um, so so it, was a, it was a genetic thing at that point. You yeah, so at sure. some point in like midsummer when the colonies were huge, you couldn't get anywhere near mm -hmm. them. You know, you had to smoke the heck out of them just to get into them. Um, and uh, of course, we didn't want to ruin the experiment. So we kept them going for the rest of the summer. But once we <laughs> finished that, we were like, we got to requeen these. Um, and so, yeah, we put queen excluders on the bottom so they couldn't swarm and everything. We were really worried about them, but they... Uh, um, the yeah i'm sorry i forgot the rest of your question but how long did it take for them to call oh well, yeah it, it's about a month i think oh, so you had to go through the whole life cycle you yeah, to get you gotta, rid of those existing things. yeah yeah you got to go through the whole life cycle and they they do calm start really calming down after a couple of weeks once you get a, a new crop of workers out but uh -huh. um, it does take a little bit of time yeah because locally i had a I gave a, uh, uh, some bees to a friend of mine and they said that they got hot all of a sudden and uh, they found out they had put a camera outside, uh, an iPhone or iPad, and they caught a skunk coming in. So they yeah. walked that path and almost immediately the hive calmed down. Mm -hmm. was, uh, so yeah, there's yeah, a lot. So of that was definitely sounds like yours was definitely genetic. And um, yeah. Yeah. And it was, um, it was, so it was all of, you know, from the one set, it was all of them. And the other set of the other line that we got from this, it was the same producer, um, but wow. he sold two different kinds and we bought both. And the one was, and we called him up and we're like, there's something going on here. And he's like, no, 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 we can't have Africanized bees. Of course he's in central Texas. So yeah, probably you do, <laughs> but um, you know, he denied it. Um, and then, uh, but I think he, later on, and I, that you know again again i left but i think as i recall talking to nick later that he said oh well we had some other complaints as well so i don't think it was just ours i think he was selling you know he had some problems the that was you know at that point so maybe the maybe the uh in. the uh migration of the africanized gene is not more natural than it is going to be man-made huh? yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> So it was that was a little it was a little shocking that we had those, but um, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm pretty sure we we once we requeened and they started settling down, it wasn't so bad. So, well, I had heard yeah. that they, they marched north at a rate of about five or fifty miles a year. So uh, when we started beekeeping, we knew that they were around San Luis Obispo, and we figured we had five good years, maybe. But uh, that was 11, 12 years ago now. Um, and then I found out that uh, in South America, they're not found below 35 degrees south. So I presume they're not found much above 35 degrees north. And I have heard that they're up in the Salinas Valley. 
but um, I think they apparently do poorly in our climate. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean they're, they're they're hot adapted bees, right? So I know they they do poorly in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think we, we can get an Africanized colony up farther north because it might hitchhike on a railroad car or a, a, a semi-trailer. Or a package. Uh, well, mm -hmm. yeah. Dewey Karen has a talk about this, about the Africanized bees. And there is a northern and southern limit uh, uh, as to how how far they, they go. And... Um, he also and he has it on a world map actually mm -hmm. so that's a really good talk he that he's he's had, has a lot of experience with the africanized or uh defensive honeybees as they call mm -hmm. it yeah i yeah, think one of the bigger factors is when people get queens and if they're mated in the valley and they come from an area that's got drone intrusion i'm starting to see hot hives on a onesie twosie basis. And to me, that's that's the first sign of Africanization kind of spreading around. So I think that's a bigger sign. And that study said they were they were all the way up to Sacramento and Napa. And even Marin had about a percentage and a half. So there it I I, I don't buy into the strict limit on latitude. What do you I mean onesie twosie, Christopher? Uh, oh, I'm still somebody else. Uh, I had a hive near Golden Gate Park, and it just, it was a queen that just, the hive was all of a sudden, you know, kind of nasty and hot. And I had to disband it. And I just have another one over in Sausalito that actually was a, a, a swarm that had moved in. And one of the, I have two hives there. One of them is a little bit hot, and somebody's been stung a couple of times. And I'm the third person that's been stung. So, it's just, you know, if they're not my own bees, then all of a sudden it's, uh, I can, you know, I can experience some heat on the hive. So I, to me, it's just, if you're not getting your queens from up north, then you have a lot of potential. And actually, there was an event that um, the San Francisco beekeepers was about 12 years ago, pulled in some bees from Esparto. And out of about 100 hives that came to the city, was through the bee store and the, the San Francisco Bee Organization. Turned out there were about a dozen hives that were absolutely Africanized. And all these poor beginning beekeepers, they didn't know what to expect. And, and the, the San Francisco crowd didn't really pay attention to, you know, holding their hands very much. And, and I personally went out to mentor several people because they requested help. And these bees were just ferociously evil. And so I, I got back to the San Francisco group and I said, you guys got to reach out to all your bee people that got packages and, and ask about, just to ask the question, how are your bees? And it turned out, but uh, that, that kind of question turned out to be about a dozen hives. So I think that's one of the bigger dangers is just kind of getting an import of um, DNA that's, that's a little fiery. Yeah, but getting stung a few times from hives. No, I'm... Uh, I'm not talking getting stung a few times. I'm talking like, you know, you, they're kamikazes. It's, I mean, it was the first time I wore gloves in a decade. So, and, and um, no, I'm not talking just, you know, incidental stings. I'm talking like you start to work a hive and they come out and they're ferocious and they cover the entire front of the hive and they're just mean as hell. So that's not just, and that's the way the dozen hives were in the San Francisco crowd, um, like a, uh, 12 years ago. Well, it brings to mind the question of during your study, uh, when you had those colonies, which you thought were Africanized, did you let them raise drones mm -hmm. or did you try and call out all the drones to keep the uh, genes confined? I tried to, to I, I tried to get rid of the, I mean, I, I tried to undo, there wasn't, there was no way to get in to manage that. So it was a matter of getting, you know, like, uh, uh, doing in the hive as quickly as possible you know i'm not like um i i it, in a populated area you just i mean i think anywhere you just can't tolerate that kind of um anti-social bee so to me it wasn't you know if you're if 
if you can actually get in there and try and manage the drone population, then then they're not that angry and hostile. But I mean, if you can't even if you can't even approach the hive to deal with it, then you just have to destroy the whole thing because it's too dangerous to get those drones out there. That's how you spread it. So I just I think people you know whenever I advise people about getting queen bees, I just suggest they get them as far north as they can for the reason you're talking about. I so, have, but, anyway, so, I so, have but, that, uh, that update, uh, California distribution of Africanized bees. It's from uh, PLOS 1.2018. Right. And it starts, you know, down in San Diego, goes, you know, up the coast and so forth with percentages of colonies that uh, have some sort of Africanized genetics in them. And up in our area, uh, it's only 2.3% in, in the East Bay, 1.6% in uh, San Mateo County. Um, and if right. I could share my screen, I could share that with you if anybody's interested. So, right. but, but also, Robert, my daughter in Slow, she's working bees and right. she loves Bispo. And, yeah. you know, the, at Cal Poly, they're all working the bees with bare hands. You know, right. no well, I, I understand. And so it's not, I mean, it's not like, yeah, they're, they're out there, they're here and there, as you say, but it's, you know, it's not pandemic time. No, but it's as, as you start to, um, <clears throat> as you start to have a percentage of your hives, more and more of my hives, I mean, it's just, it's very unusual to show up with hives that are, that are nasty and sting people. And so it's just, instead of, you know, one a decade now, it's starting to be, you know, uh, a, a number of hives. And that's, to me, that's just, and then when those drones start mating with queens in the area, then it's just, it raises the temperature of the, of the hostility of the bees in the area. So all I'm, all I'm suggesting is that people pay much more attention to where they get their bees. Cause if you're, if you, so that's that 2018 study. So you go to Sacramento, there's a small percentage, but you go south two counties and it's up to something like 38%. 16.9. 16.9, okay. And then below that is 6.9 and below that is 12.5. Okay. So, I mean, I could, can I please share my screen? Is that okay? But I also have the hybrid zone from uh, the the uh, latitude north and south that Dewey uh, shared with us. Um, so I can't do it. I'm the host of dis disabled participants from sharing the screen. Um, well, I'm wondering, are we drifting away from asking our presenter the questions that are for him? <laughs> Yeah, we we. I apologize. I just had. Yeah, to, that, that, I, this is not. Uh, I just. But I I keep so hearing great. about oh the bees will never go over thirty eight percent thirty eight degrees latitude and I just don't buy it. Yeah. Practical experience tells me otherwise. Okay. So sorry. That's I had to. Sorry for intruding that. Well, yeah, yeah I've also heard that they they are capable of uh, going all the way up to the Canadian border. I hope yeah. not. So, Jamie, one thing I wanted to ask you about was the uh, was uh, how many families are, do you think are in a in a in a package? Um, so, there's been some research and discussion that you know a, a a good colony wants you know ten bee families or more in there, and that is sometimes the reason for them you know choosing to requeen later in the summer is that there's just not enough bee families. Mm -hmm. Um, in the hive yeah we you know we actually um that was sort of going to be the next step of this um study before i got another job and left uh so we, we were going to do the genetics and actually look at how many um families were in there but we never got that done so i can't yeah. answer that question i think you know there there are other people have done studies looking at colonies and, and good colonies i would say 10 would be a pretty low number if you only had 10 families. Um, Cause I think Dave Tarpey at North Carolina state found that there's something like 28 or 30 families um, that you will find in a lot of colonies in North America. That's not unusual. 
And all you need is one of those families to be uh, mean and you got yourself a hot hive. Well, I think, I don't think one would do it. I think you would need to have, you know, 25% of the drones or something for them really to, to, uh, that the queen mated with um, yeah. to, to make that hive that aggressive, you know, the, the, where you would not be able to work it. Um, I think it, it, there's there's probably somebody's probably figured that number out. I don't know what it is, but um, at but one I of guess the, it would be more than just a couple drones. That probably wouldn't matter so much. At one of the um, Mount Diablo meetings, Eric Musen was apic apiculturist for the state. Uh, mm -hmm. He said three eighths would make a hive that was just difficult and and rasty to handle, and any more than three eighths was full on Africanized. I feel really good about my 25% guess now. <laughs> <laughs> but, but could, could, I, could I counter that by saying, uh, from what I've experienced in a number of hives, you know, if a queen starts laying in with a particular uh, batch of DNA, you can have, you know, if they're all related to one particular drone, then you can end up having, you know, three or four months worth of, of bee offspring that are of particular, of Africanized DNA. And I, am I wrong about that? I mean, well, I, well, well that, that begs the question that I've, that I've had for a long time is, you know, does the, does the queen select for families or do families kind of come in waves out of the queen? So I, I can answer this one because I actually did, um, for my PhD, I did a bunch of uh, um, meeting stuff. And, 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 uh, and so, the, the reality is, is most of that sperm in the spermatheca is mixing and you don't typically get single, like a lot of a single family, even on a frame. If you remove the workers out and you look to see how many families on, on a batch of eggs that she's laid, it's not generally from a single one. Not that that couldn't happen, but there's not a lot of evidence that says that she clumps families as she's laying or that she can somehow select the sperm which drone sperm to lay at any given time <laughs> it's more random oh, uh, okay all the evidence Good. suggests that but you know Man, i think if you're at first down, first down. <laughs> i mean if you're at if you're at three out of eight um you know uh bees in a hive that are that are of african descent that's gonna be like that's not gonna be fun to to keep them right and i think that that's you start getting to robert's point of like that's you need to get rid of those um you know yeah otherwise your neighbors are going to get rid of you right uh and so why did you keep your bees as long as you did the ones you stuck the ones from texas yeah we were running an experiment and like i said we took we actually once we oh, drew, you had the queen excluders on there that's right. yeah and then we put queen excluders on the bottom that keeps the drones from getting out too right, right so everybody's right. stuck in there um now obviously when you're working the hive drones can can fly away and stuff but um yeah we 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 uh were like this isn't good um but we also wanted to complete the experiment so as soon as we got to the point where we could weigh them um and requeen them we did i got it so, so we were we were trying not to take too many risks but and we were cutting out drone comb and things like that as well so yeah we were we were trying to manage it as, as best we could but you could all the other colonies we had you could go out and you could work without gloves on and you could you know they were nice colonies and uh, but these ones we had to like you know taping up your your pants and and uh double gloving and things like so, that they were just not the, nice bees some of the people uh equate um aggressiveness or defensiveness which or whatever you want to call it to uh they say that parallels honey production whereas some people believe that the reason that it feels like it's more defensive is because Usually, the bigger hives are more productive, and they have more guard bees. So, uh, what's your opinion on that? Is, to do the does the aggressiveness of a hive correlate to the volume of honey? No, no. I, I, I'm 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 going to say I've had some really nice gentle bees that have produced ridiculous amounts of honey, and I've had you know more. I mean, obviously you got a lot of bees, a big hive and you can, you know, um, yeah, right. there's more chances to get stung. You got more bees in the air, but, um, but I don't think that the aggressiveness, and I think there's actually probably somebody's probably done this and, and actually measured we, what we did with these. And this is, was interesting. We, we filmed this a few times. You can take a, 
a string and you can put a little patch of leather on that string and you can dangle it in front of the entrance of the hive and you just shake it a little bit. And just that movement of that leather, the guard bees will come out and they'll start investigating it. They want to know what that is. Um, and you can actually do this for a timed amount of time. So if you say shake that piece of leather for or felt, we had little black pieces of felt, I think is what we used. Um, and you put those on there and you shake them. The, the, the they'll come out and they'll start stinging it um, to get rid of it, right? So the, they don't like it. So if you do this for 30 seconds, you'll get a certain response. What would happen on a normal, you know, European, you know, say it's Italians or something, um, and, and you shake this, you might get two or three stings on that patch in 30 seconds, or maybe none. They just come out and look at it and then fly back in once they decide it's not, you know, an enemy. But these really nasty hives, when you do that with that felt, they cover it. They're just literally bees like just stinging and stinging and trying to knock each other off so they can sting that because their their response of defensiveness is is just so much higher. And that's what we were seeing on these. And that's, you know, that's sort of an indication that you have a hive, whether whether they're Africanized or not, they're out of control and you don't want those, right? Um, especially once you're like, oh, it's all of these and we've ruled out skunks and we've ruled out other things. You just got to requeen them. Yeah, in 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 a urban environment or our environment, I don't even think we have time for you know for requeening. You know, sometimes you just got to either get them out of there mm -hmm. or kill them because yeah, it's not, well, not worth you know the, the repercussions of somebody getting stung really badly. Right. But I like that. I like that test method. That's great. Look, somebody complains about their hives, and we'll we'll go do that. Yeah. yeah, I had a hive one time that was pretty calm, and then when it got requeened, I noticed that if I put my hands over the hive, you could hear the roar. It would roar, you know. And whereas the pre previous queen, it wasn't like that. But I don't know if I got stung from that, but it was definitely a scary roar to hear. I had a uh, when I was first learning the 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 person I was learning to keep bees from. She taught me the, she called it the um, uh, hive tool test. And she'd take the hive tool and she'd just wave it over the door she, after she'd open up oh. the hive and wave it over. And if the bees came out and tried to sting it, then she was like, oh, these are nasty. That was her, like, wow. they're nasty as they came out. Yeah. Um, if once she smoked them, if they were at all aggressive, she didn't like them. She wanted really calm bees. Yeah. But everybody has their, their own threshold for that. But Certainly, if they're coming out in, in swarms, then you don't you don't need them. I I, I need to get going. Um, okay. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, thank, thank you, you Jamie. very much for for sharing your evening with us, and thank you for putting up with all of our questions. Thank you oh, very welcome. much. Yeah, I, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right. Good night.